Um, welcome to Operationalizing Guided Pathways Through Classified Engagement. Um, my name is Akia Marshall. Um, my co-presenter is... Natalie Halsell. Welcome. So glad to have you here. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so just a, a teeny bit of housekeeping before we get into our presentation. Um, I see that many of you are muted and you have your uh, cameras either on or off. That's perfect. That's like, we don't even have to go into all that. Um, I will say though, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, staying muted only so that we don't have, you know, like background noise or anything uh, distracting um, so that we can all, you know, focus on the presentation, that would be great. Um, we do have access to the chat. And so if you have a question during the presentation or comment even, you're more than welcome to type that into the chat. Now, because Natalie and I are going to be kind of tag teaming this presentation and jumping back and forth, um, we're not going to be checking the chat as we're moving through the presentation, but there is a question and answer uh, portion at the end. Um, and so we will do our best to try to address some of the questions that have come up in the chat at that time. Um, and then also, I believe that we'll provide you with some opportunities to uh, contact us if you would like to um, after today's event as well. Did I forget anything, Natalie? Okay, perfect. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Ta -da, hold on a minute, that's me, that's, that's my part. Okay, so presentation overview. All right, so for you today, we're gonna have a few items that we'd like to cover with you. One of them is the very beginning uh, is to kind of give you our definition about what we mean about engagement. We have an activity that we've called Category Is Guided Pathways Pillars. Um, we're gonna talk about why engagement matters. We're gonna talk about why classified professionals and guided pathways. We're gonna talk a little bit about classified professional, professionals engagement at Riverside City College. We have something for your consideration and you're gonna get a little homework. It's not bad, it's not a term paper. It's just a little something. It's a little something for you to consider. It's not scary, it's not a video. All right, so that's our presentation overview and we're gonna get started with what do we mean by engagement? And so we wanted to start out by kind of setting the stage for what our definition of uh, engagement is for us here today. And we're using a Forbes definition. Forbes defines employee engagement as the emotional commitment the employee has to the organization and its goal, right? Makes sense. Employees that care about their work within the institution aren't just working to receive a paycheck. They're working towards achievement of the institutional goals. And you know, this type of intrinsic motivation is really special and needs to be protected and encouraged. Right? Um, additionally, you'll hear us talking about meaningful engagement. So what does that mean? What is meaningful? Um, so I looked it up um, and I found a, a couple of different definitions, but the one that I liked the, the best talked about doing things with purpose. Um, so as we talk about engaging classified professionals, we mean with purpose, right? So as an example, I know that I've attended meetings and, you know, everybody in the room was, you know, faculty and administration and, you know, there were just a few classified and everybody looked at me and was like, okay, so you're classified, you're here to take notes. Well, that, um, that is not meaningfully <laughs> engaging, right? If I'm just recording everything that's taking place, though that is important, um, that's not meaningfully engaging me, right? So uh, to take it a little bit further, um, we want to make sure that as you're engaging with your classified professionals uh, in a meaningful way, that you're doing it in a way that conveys that they are valued and respected, right? And that their expertise is recognized. So that's what we mean by uh, meaningful. Exactly. All right. And so one of the definitions we also wanted to share with you today is um, the expressions classified professionals, or CPROs for short. Many classified employees have expressed a desire to be called classified professionals. And this is because that definition really comes closer to acknowledging the expertise and con contributions that we make to student success. And so as such, we're gonna be referring to classified employees as CPROs for, in, for short in this presentation. All right, next, Ooh, wrong, wrong screen, okay. Next. All right, it is time for our first activity. Well, it's kind of our only activity, but it's time for the activity, right? So uh, what we are going to do is um, we're going to have you guys uh, kind of place each of these classified positions uh, in the underneath the guided pathways pillar that you feel their work is associated. Hopefully that made some kind of sense. So as you can see on the left hand of the slide, um, we have some sample classified position titles, right? So um, these are all titles that currently exist at Riverside City College, like counseling clerk, outreach specialist, maintenance mechanic, uh, instructional department specialist, which we will refer to as IDS because it's just easier, right? Um, and then on the right-hand side, 
you have the different, the four pillars of guided pathways, right? So you have clarifying the path, entering the path, staying on the path and ensuring learning, right? So what we are asking you to do or what we're going to ask you to do in a moment and uh, using the poll feature um, is we're going to have each of these positions listed um, and you're going to identify which one, uh, which option you think best represents that individual's work under the appropriate uh, pillar of guided pathways. So as an example or to further explain, let's say that option A has the um, IDS listed in the first space. That would mean that you consider the IDS's work in supporting the clarify the path pillar, right? So pillar one, right? Um, and let's say that on that same uh, option, it lists the outreach specialist uh, seconds. So that would mean that you consider uh, the work of the outreach spe specialist um, as assisting with entering the path, which is uh, pillar two, okay? Again, hopefully that made some kind of sense. Working with these polls was not super easy, so we did our best. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you just, just a second to kind of review the positions and uh, remind yourselves of the pillars, and I believe that I have the ability to launch that poll, and so I'm going to do it now, and then I believe also, in addition to um, having the cat go back and forth, oh, the poll, poll went automatically, um, in addition to having the, uh, the cat make a, a guest appearance, which she often does, I believe that my colleague Natalie was going to regale us with her uh, uh, vocal stylings, was that correct? I'll try the vocal styling. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to give you five more seconds. I'm going to count it down. Um, five seconds. You've got four seconds. I see only nine of you have participated. Oh, ten. Perfect. You've got three more seconds. Get your answers in, get your answers in. You've got two yeah, more yeah. seconds. <laughs> yeah, right? You've got one more second. Okay, you got a couple more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and to confirm, Akia, so when it asked us to click one, we were supposed to ask, we we're supposed to answer which one fits into clarify the path. Right, pillar. so we have them listed in the order um, of the pillars, right? So okay. if you pick uh, option one, um, then you're saying that the counseling clerk supports clarifying the path, the outreach specialist supports entering the path, the maintenance mechanic, you know, so on and so forth. So, okay, I see that we've got about a good portion of our group have participated in the poll. So I'm going to go ahead and close it now. All right, it is closed. And I'm going to go ahead and share the results so that we all are able to see them. Oh, they're, they've been shared. All right. So it looks like the majority of uh, people who participated um, indicated that the first order, right? So counseling clerk would support pillar one, outreach specialist would support pillar two, maintenance mechanic would support pillar three, um, and the IDS would support pillar four. Awesome. Thank you so much for participating in our poll. And now let's see the at one. Well, let's see what we had to say about it. So I believe right. that you, so, so yeah. this is what we have to say about it. Now, like, you know, he and Natalie hanging out. All right. So the answer is dun, 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 all positions support all four pillars. Ha ha, trick question. All right. So let's let's talk this through, right? I'm going to go with the example of the maintenance mechanic because that might see, may, may seem like the most obscure. You'll see here that we've identified a maintenance mechanic directly supports pillars three and four. That seems easy enough, right? Um, without safe buildings to occupy, students would be, have a classroom to come to, or in other words, to be able to stay on the path, right? And without the right heating and air conditioning, they wouldn't be able to learn. And in that way, they, um, by having the right heating and air, we have, we're able to ensure learning, right? I think we can all relate and to suffering in a building that's either too hot or too cold, it's just too, way too hard to concentrate, right? So in this way, your maintenance mechanics do their part to ensure a healthy learning environment, right? Indirectly, they also support pillars one and two. And let me explain how. I was contacted just last week by members of our maintenance department with a request to be provided with the best contact information for our counseling, financial aid, and admissions and records departments. 
while the college is still closed due to COVID, they're, they're encountering students. And so they're on, on campus, they're making their repairs, they're making sure the classrooms are, you know, you know, operational. And so they wanted to be able to refer students to the right departments. And so in this way, they too are um, able to uh, clarify the path for students, right? Um, by, by being sure that they're educated on the basics that's of enrollment, that's how we empower them to be able to assist the students in that way. And also by providing them with the best point of contact, they essentially can also help students enter the path, right? They're directing um, students to the right person. And in this way, they too contribute to student access and success. So a little something for you to think about in terms of their roles and um, you know, how they really do all show up in all four pillars. So next, we're gonna have a little conversation about why engagement matters, right? So with, with our working, of, working definition of engagement, we wanna kind of move through the, this conversation. And we're gonna begin with, you know, engagement builds relational trust. So in order for an organization to fully scale uh, the implementation of guided pathways, there's gotta be a deep level of relational trust. And it's necessary because it encourages risk-taking and innovation on the part of your classified and professionals. If they trust the messaging, if they understand, where you're coming from because they've been engaged, they're gonna be more willing to take steps to further achieving those goals for the institution, right? By creating that culture of engagement, employees are given an opportunity to connect with each other. And this also reinforces the message that we are all working together towards the same goal. Right. Um, additionally, I just always think about many hands make light work, right? So if Guided Pathways is really focused on redesigning our institutions to make them better for our students so that they could be more successful, we're not just talking about one or two or three areas, right? We're talking about the whole organization, the whole institution. Um, so you wanna involve the whole organization, the whole institution. Um, if you think about, well, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you guys have, have ever tried to move a large object, right? Uh, a piano, a bed, something like that. If you're in a group of, oh, I don't know, five, six people, but only two people are actively trying to move that bed, I don't know about you, but the first thing I'm going to say is, okay, so these other people who are here, are they not, are they unable to help? Like, this is heavy. It's all hands on deck. Let's move this bed, right? It is the same with guided pathways, right? This is not light work. It's not super easy work. It's definitely meaningful and important to our students and our communities, but it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And so for it to be successful, and even I would say carried out uh, the best possible way the first time. Uh, we really want to engage everybody, and that absolutely includes your classified professionals. Uh, there is, and I know Natalie will talk about this in a moment, but there is a wealth of expertise there um, that you definitely want to make sure that you take advantage of. Absolutely. All right, so next we want to talk a little bit about how engagement demonstrates integrity. And it, integrity is demonstrating, demonstrating when there's consistency between what is said and what, is, what actually takes place. And through authentic engagement, you, you share messages. And by sharing these messages, you accomplish two things. You accomplish um, showing that there is no hidden agenda and that leaders can also be held accountable for, the, for being consistent in their messaging. So you've said it publicly. Now you can hold me accountable for what I've said is going to happen, right? And so that's the, that's the way you build that relational trust as well. Right. Okay. So Sorry, I clicked on something. It, things happen. This anyway, is my part. I'm back. Too. I'm so back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something happened. Okay, you go. All right. So um, engage, engagement matters because it increases um, if listening leads to respect. So engagement is evidence that the college leadership cares enough to listen to varying perspectives. A knife is sharpened when we strike it against a stone, right? Conflict isn't always a bad thing, you guys. We need to learn how to be challenged. And it's through the willingness to be to listen, we can demonstrate respect for all the unique skills, abilities, and insights of your classified professionals. And again, this also strengthens relational trust. Right, absolutely. Um, additionally, it can lead to comprehensive and widespread communication, right? That's kind of what we are putting out here. Um, and so I always kind of think of that whole, that old tale, like if a tree falls and like nobody is around to hear it, didn't make a noise, right? So within our organizations, within our institutions, if one area, one department is doing something amazing, right? They had an amazing event that really helped the students out, uh, gave them a ton of information, you know, helped set them up to be successful. 
but nobody else in the organization knows that that's taking place or that that took place. Was it really that amazing, right? Like we really should be taking every opportunity within our, our college communities to brag about what we're doing, right? This will also help us to establish best practices. So, you know, if I'm finding out that admissions and records does this amazing process where students are able to, to receive service um, very quickly, they're very happy when they leave, you know, those types of things, then why wouldn't I want to know about that so that I can have that translate into our financial aid department? Maybe they can either take that same practice or modify that practice to suit their needs, but have the students come out with the same positive results, right? If we don't know that these types of things are taking place within our organization, how, how, can, we, how can we utilize them? How can we translate them from area to area, right? And so um, your classified professionals are going to pay, pay, play, I'm sorry, uh, a big role in that. We talk. <laughs> we talk. We talk at work. We talk outside of work. We talk on Facebook. We talk on Instagram. Right? We talk. Um, and so we want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Um, and we want to make sure that includes our classified professionals so that they can in turn make sure that their colleagues know what's going on, right? And that they have the most up-to-date information um, so that they can be, again, leading or lending a hand to this heavy work that we're taking on of implementing guided pathways. Absolutely. And then last, simply put, engagement leads to better overall outcomes, period. It just does, you guys. It does. We know this, right? So with that, our, ooh, okay. So now we're going to have a conversation about why classified professionals. Take it away, Akia. Yes. So obviously we've talked about how important it is really for everybody to be doing the work of guided pathways all across your organization, all across your institution. But like, why is it important that classified professionals be included in that, right? Like it's kind of what this whole workshop is about, right? Um, so it's important for a few different reasons. Number one, classified professionals uh, tend to have a unique perspective and that is for a few different reasons. Number one, uh, well, I said number one twice, sorry. Uh, a, um, we have unique relationships with students. Um, we tend to interact and deal with students and we're not in, in a, a position of authority we're not necessarily making decisions. We might be advising why a decision was made or informing a process, but we're not actually saying, yes, this is gonna happen. No, this is not gonna happen, right? We're not saying, yes, you're gonna get $50,000 in financial aid. No, you're only gonna get you know, $2,000 in financial aid, right? Um, generally, right? So because we're not in a position of authority with them, um, we have an opportunity to, to deal with them a, a little bit more on a peer type level, right? Um, so, you know, maybe they would not tell their faculty member or maybe they would not tell um, the dean or, you know, whoever that they're, they're having a hard time with this process or this process doesn't make sense or it just really is not working for them and their uh, unique situation. But they, they'll tell that counter staff person, oh, I don't have an ID. Okay, well, you have to have an ID. Okay, well, that kind of sucks because I can't get an ID, right? And then they explain why, right? Those are the types of interactions and relationships that we're able to build with, with students at times. And because of those unique relationships, we also are able to advocate their, their voice even further. Now, we all have a full understanding that each of our campuses generally has um, an associated student body, right? Um, and they participate in various uh, strategic planning activities, right? Um, but there's still a, a group of students um, within our institutions who are maybe not even connecting to their student government, to their student leadership, to be telling them, hey, this isn't working for me, right? But again, as counter staff, as individuals who are working, quote unquote, on the front lines uh, with these students, we're hearing those stories, right? And it's not to say that we're not telling them, hey, you need to, you should tell your student leadership this and you should make sure you let them know. But sometimes they're just not following through on that, right? So we are able, because of the position that we're in, to utilize that information. And when we go to strategic planning meetings or when we have department meetings, we're able to share that information with our colleagues, with our managers, um, with our administration to say, look, this, this process, it's, I'm hearing from students, it's not quite working, right? Or it's not working for everybody or most of them, right? Um, additionally, many of, of the CPROs are uh, previous students and alumni. Some of us are even taking classes as we're working at these institutions, right? So we're filling two roles, really. Um, and so because we are either very, very recently uh, have attended our, our institutions or are currently attending our institutions, we can bring that perspective as well, right? So we can say, hey, look, I know the, the process behind this, this policy, 
But I'm telling you as a student trying to follow that process, it's, it's not super easy. It kind of doesn't make sense, right? And we're able to, to bring that knowledge um, into the departments uh, and into our institution to make improvements, right? Or at least that's what we're, that's what we're advocating for. <laughs> that's one thing that we believe that your CPROs would be able to do. Absolutely. Okay. And then next, you know, our class of our professionals, we execute the work. So typically we know how it works. There's a plan. It goes through committee and um, you may or may not have classified professionals that sit on those committees and contribute to the writing of the plans, but they may not necessarily be the ones who actually execute the plan, right? So once plans are, have been created and formally adopted, the classified professionals are the ones who are going to execute the work. They're going to operationalize those plans. So don't plan about us without us. By engaging your classified professionals from the very beginning, they're going to be able to identify those inefficiencies in the plan and identify inequitable practices, okay? They see how that plan is gonna be executed and they can identify um, how those processes might negatively impact students right at the beginning. And so an example I like to use is, you know, I, I, in my former position, I worked for a dean of an academic department. And in my role, I often saw students as they navigated the late petition process. And so I saw from my seat how the students had to go to admissions and records, pick up a form, bring it to the faculty member, bring it from the faculty member back to the dean's office, leave it with me, the dean signs, I have to call them, they pick it back up from the dean's office and then they, they have to take it back over to admissions and records, records all to add a late class, right? And then, and so I saw how, you know, this is really hard on these students, it's five o'clock at, at five, three o'clock on a Friday and I gotta get the student who has to take three buses to come pick up your form, the dean has an opportunity to sign it. Hurry, hurry, I'm gonna call admissions and records and say, I've got a student, they're running off the bus right now. Do you see what I mean? I can, I can identify how those practices are inequitable and how they're impacting that student directly. And so it's really important to engage the classified because they're the ones that see it coming out, you know, all playing out, right? So, oh, and yeah, okay, and then moving on, to, I'm forgetting my order of things, sorry guys. Okay, and so next to, to, to consider is that your classified professionals, you often have hidden gems, and I can't um, like describe enough how important it is to really get to know your employees through engaging them, engaging them in the work they're going to execute. You'll, also, you'll often find that through simple conversations, you maybe need to like identify your next digital media expert, a social media guru, or whatever it might be, that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to identify those strengths and abilities through the regular performance of their day-to-day -day duties, right? And so um, by sitting down, having a conversation and breaking down processes and investigating inefficient inefficiencies by getting to know who they are and how they perform their work, you've got um, an, an opportunity to identify um, resolutions before even rolling out a plan. And so, you know, you've got those hidden gems. I've got some friends that are like, the, the process, like the way they audit processes and really can break it down and find um, the improvements is amazing. But if we don't engage these individuals, you'll never know about it, right? Right. Uh, last but certainly not least, um, in engaging, including your CPROs, supports a truly equitable environment, right? So right now, all of our institutions statewide, and I would even argue all over the nation, are focused on equity, right? Usually when we're having these conversations, we're talking about student equity. And obviously that's important because we're, we're schools, right? We're institutions of higher education, right? So we definitely wanna be focused on uh, making sure that our students um, are receiving you know, equitable services, outcomes, so on and so forth. But let's take it one step further. If we're gonna talk about equity, let's talk about equity for everybody, right? For the entire college community. Obviously understanding that our students are important and we are putting a lot of time, effort, and focus on student equity, but the college community consists of more than just the students, right? So engaging your classified professionals, having them be involved, getting their input, their feedback um, in regards to guided pathways, and I would argue pretty much any other large-scale uh, uh, project or program, um, supports a truly equitable uh, college environment, right? Institutional environment. It takes it one step further than just student equity, and shows that your, your institutions are focused on equity, period, all equity, right? 
Um, so that's another reason that we think you would want to definitely make sure to include your classified professionals. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So now we're going to go into a little bit of a conversation about um, a classified engagement at Riverside City College. And one of the first ways that we um, have provided opportunities for our classified professionals to engage is through simple participation in our Guided Pathways Committee. Uh, it's an open committee. Um, there's no formal appointment process. Anybody can participate. And um, you know that's just one small way that you can kind of open the door and um, invite your classified professionals in. Right. Another thing that we've done at uh, Riverside City College is we have our Caring Campus group so this is a group of individuals, we call ourselves the Caring Campus Ambassadors, who have either gone through the um, IEBC Caring Campus coaching sessions, and we even have some who have not gone through the coaching sessions, but recognize the work that Caring Campus was uh, trying to do and wanted to become involved, right? And so through that group, we've done things like hosted uh, Guided Pathways Lunch and Learns. And these were opportunities um, for uh, focus on classified professionals, but open to anybody who wanted to attend. Um, where the Guided Pathways coordinator for our college talked about what Guided Pathways is, right? What is it going to look like at RCC? Where are we in the process? What are we doing, right? So it was just a really good opportunity for any and everybody to become a little bit more familiar with what Guided Pathways is and how it was taking place uh, at Riverside City College. Um, we did a few of those and we actually did them virtually. Um, we had a pretty good, pretty good turnout. Um, additionally, we've had uh, what we call Caring Connections. Um, and these are uh, hosted in collaboration with our Classified Leadership and Success, so our Classified Focus Professional Development Committee um, with our, our Caring Campus. Um, and they've hosted workshops where we highlight individual departments, right? Especially departments that are often not highlighted, right? Um, and so I know that we've done uh, academic support and that was an opportunity for the classified professionals in academic support to share with their colleagues and anybody else in the college who was interested in hearing what they do, right? What they do, what they don't do, <laughs> and how they're servicing and helping students, uh, supporting students in a virtual environment. Um, I know that we recently did one with the Outreach and Welcome Center, um, which I think is amazing. I think, you know, this was an opportunity for people to find out what does outreach do, right? How, are, are we recruiting at the schools? What does that look like? Are we still doing that virtually? This was an opportunity for uh, the, out, the classified professionals in the outreach department to talk about, yes, we are absolutely um, still working very closely with our high schools. We, and, and these are the types of things that we're able to do virtually with the Welcome Center. We're definitely still assisting students and applying and, you know, financial aid and, and those types of things. So these have been some amazing workshops. Um, I believe the next one that we have coming up is going to be focused on the Gateway to College program at Riverside City College. Um, and so I look forward to you know, even more members of the college community, but especially our classified professionals, uh, to be able to understand and hear some of the amazing things that are happening in that program. Yes, definitely. And so another item that we've done at Riverside City College is that we've incorporated a discussion um, about guided pathways in the new employee onboarding. And so when a new a classified professional comes on board, we meet with them and we discuss specifically how their individual roles show up in all four pillars. So much like that activity that we did with all of you, we do something similar with our classified professionals. This is a really important part of the norming process. Um, we want them to come in understanding that this is a college that is committed to guided pathways. This is just who we are. And this is how you fit into who we are. And so, you know, that creates buy-in right from the get-go. And then there's some ownership of that, right? Um, we've included them in the conversation right from the beginning. So now moving forward, even the, if they've had no experience in the community college system, they're gonna recognize those words, right? And they're gonna go, oh, maybe this is something I should be reading, right? It's gonna prompt their attention in a more deliberate kind of way. Right. Uh, additionally, we've uh, been able to, in collaboration with the Regional Guided Pathways coordinators and some classified professionals from some of the other institutions within our region, host these Region 9 uh, classified convenings. So um, again, these are opportunities for uh, classified professionals across the region in various uh, areas of each individual institution um, to gather pretty much quarterly and just kind of touch base, uh, share best practices, uh, get a little bit of information. Uh, and then I think that the best thing about those uh, classified convenings is that in addition to you know, providing information, sharing information, we, uh, we take it a step further and talk about, okay, so how do you use this at your institution, right? We're giving you something, 
how do you take it and make it useful, quote unquote, back where you're from, right? So um, we've talked about uh, the nomenclature of classified professional. We've talked about, you know, how are our individual colleges within the region um, adapting and changing uh, so that we can continue to, to serve students virtually, right? What's going on at Victor Valley? What's going on at College of the Desert? Oh, you guys are doing that? That's amazing. I would love to be able to do that at RCC. How exactly did you do that, right? Um, those are the types of conversations that we're having at the Region 9 Classified Convenings. Um, we happen to have two amazing, <laughs> and I cannot say it enough, amazing uh, Regional Guided Pathways uh, coordinators, and that is Leslie Valmonte, who is with us today, um, and then also Angelica Ibarra. Um, and so if you are a classified professional or if you wanna make sure that classified professionals from your institution uh, is aware of these classified convenings, I strongly recommend that you reach out to your regional uh, coordinator, uh, your re regional guided pathways coordinator, um, just so that we can make sure that, you, that they're connected and they're participating in these events. I cannot tell you how amazing they have been, especially being able to do them virtually. Um, it, it makes it, I, I know that there's a tendency working virtually virtually to feel very siloed and alone and you're at home, you're not in the office, you're not engaging with your colleagues the way that you normally would, but these convenings have been able to provide an opportunity for people to do that, right? And across the region, so not even just within your own institution, but I know I met somebody from Barstow, I would have never met somebody from Barstow, right? I've, I've connected with individuals from Victor Valley, from College of the Desert, um, and I would not have otherwise had that opportunity. So I can't, I think that's the end of my shameless plug, but if you have not uh, if, or if individuals from your institution have not been able to participate in those, I strongly, strongly encourage you to connect with your Regional Guided Pathways Coordinator so that you can get the information. I believe the next one is going to be May 11th. So just mark that on your calendars. That's that. Okay, so now we're getting into the meat and the potatoes, right? This is the good stuff. Mwahaha. All right, so we're going to get into a discussion of some suggested activities. All right, we're gonna start with an, um, a, a suggestion that perhaps you begin by investigating the individual work through an equity lens. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, how often do or your managers actually sit with employees to identify the work that they have on their plates, right? I've got um, colleagues who have been working at the institution for 20 years, and um, they learned when a new manager comes in that the detailed analysis and report that they've generated month to month is no longer necessary, has not been necessary for the last 10 years, but nobody sat and investigated that work with them, okay? And so um, as, I, as I mentioned in my early example about the late ad petition, had somebody sat down with me, I would have been able to process map that out, right? And go, okay, step one, here's a bucket. Step two, here's a bucket. And by sitting down with that and mapping out that process, I may have been able to make some recommendations about, you know, steps two and seven really kind of seem silly, right? Is there a way we can take this 15 step process and reduce it down to 10 steps, right? And so you've got that exchange. And so me and my role, I may not recognize that no step seven, the IT department really kind of needs, we can't get rid of that step, but I see where we could maybe modify this step or do things a little bit different over here, right? that just by creating a very simple process workflow, you'd be surprised how you can identify um, uh, things that are inequitable to students, right? So looking at that work, investigating the work and clarifying the path of that employee's work will likely lead to identification of inequitable practices and really create some changes that could be really valuable to the students, right? Um, yeah. Additionally, uh we suggest ensuring that all employees of the college, right? So not even just your classified professionals, but all employees of the college are aware of the enrollment process. Now, I'm not saying that every employee within the college needs to be able to sit down and process a financial aid application and determine, you know, what the student is eligible. That's, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But wouldn't it be amazing is if as individuals, you know, return to our campus or are returning to our campuses, as prospective students come on our campus and they see, a grounds person or uh, a maintenance mechanic or you know somebody that they know works here and say hey I, I wanna I want to be a student here I want to start the process I don't know what to do you know and that individual regardless of their position within the college be able to say oh okay well the first step is going to be to do the admissions application and we do that online 
and you know it's through this website. Um, if you if you need a computer with internet access, we have this welcome center, and it's just a couple buildings over. Um, you know, and after that, depending on your status, uh, your student status, then you're probably going to need to do an orientation. And you know, that's pretty quick and simple. It's a series of videos, but it's just where we're going to explain to you how the college works. And then after that, you'll be able to write right to be able to go through just at a basic level the steps to enrollment. Right? Wouldn't that be amazing? Like in my mind that would be the goal. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, and so we would encourage you to ensure that, again, all employees of the college at least have a basic uh, understanding of the steps uh, of enrollment at your institution. And this can be accomplished through workshops at Flex or all college professional development days or any other uh, large scale uh, group type event um, that you have on your campus, whether it be you know annually or whatever, um, just to ensure that they have the information. Um, additionally, sorry, uh, additionally, um, we suggest that you build, allow your classified professionals to build a community of practice. That's one of the main reasons that we've continued on with the Region 9 or started and continued on with the Region 9 convenings, right? So um, we're suggesting that you allow your CPROs to, to meet regularly. I can tell you that I think it was the second coaching session um, of the Caring Campus program. Um, I know we looked, we looked around the room, myself, Natalie, and, and our colleagues, and was like, it's just really kind of neat that we're able to, to get together like this, right? It's just us in a room. There were no managers, right? Um, and we just started talking. And I know for myself, I was able to start talking to people that I had been emailing for years. I mean, years, <laughs> probably decades. But I'd never been in the same room with them. We had never shared the same air, right? Like we had never, you know, been able to meet in person. Um, and so it was amazing to be like, oh, you're you're Lilia. I've been emailing you forever. We've been working together forever. It's awesome to see you in person, right? Um, and then naturally, naturally, what happens after that? Hey, so you know this process? I was gonna ask you, like, uh, does it have to be this way? Or how can we do it that way? Or what's the history behind? you know, the, us doing this form in paper instead of allowing students to submit it, you know, electronically, like, do we have to do that? Or how does your department feel about that, right? Because I know that this happens between a few different departments, right? So we start having conversations about best practice and can these things be changed? And what do you think about this, right? Um, and so being able to meet also allows us the opportunity to, um, to establish a network um, and then create better and more accurate student referrals, right? So if this whole time I've been at the college and I, I don't have, you know, a super extensive knowledge of how students make payments. So when a student asks me, I'm like, I don't know, I guess you do it through financial aid, right? And I'm sending students to financial aid to make a payment, which our financial aid office is not where students make payment. It's through student accounts or the cashier's office, right? But if I've not necessarily gotten the opportunity to meet the individuals in financial aid and be like, hey, do you guys do payments? And then say, no, we don't. Actually, that goes through, that goes through student accounts. I've been, I've been putting out erroneous student referrals, right? I've been sending students kind of off into the abyss and hoping that's the right direction, right? But if I have the opportunity to, to get together with the individuals that work in those individual uh, departments, right? If I have an opportunity to regularly meet with or see the individuals in financial aid, I can find out, oh no, I shouldn't have been sending them there. I really should have been sending them to student accounts or to the cashier. And then additionally, once I get to know those individuals, I'm not only just sending them to a department, I can send them to an individual person. Okay, so you're going to go to the cashier's office. You're going to see Jamie. She's so nice. She is super nice. Uh, I know she'll be able to help you with your payment, right? So I'm also gonna just give her a heads up and let her know that you're on your way because it's on the other side of campus or it's virtual and I'm asking you to email her, right? Um, and so I wanna make sure that you get connected. So I'm just gonna give her a heads up and she'll be looking for you, right? Imagine that the feeling that a student has from that type of, of interaction with you, right? Now they feel like they're being taken care of. They're getting something special. They went to one like friend and now they're going to another friend who's gonna continue to take care of them, right? So. Uh, being able to meet regularly, again, identifies um, best practices amongst departments, um, as well as allows us to establish or maintain or even strengthen um, our student referrals, right? Because now we know our colleagues and we're not sending them off into the, the blackness of night. I'm sending you to Natalie or I'm sending you to Lamar, right? 
Yeah. And so last, you know, by engaging with your CPROs, investigating their work and learning about their unique uncovered skills and abilities, you have an opportunity to build their capacity to grow. A classified professional who's been with the organization for a few years may not feel comfortable enough to approach their manager with requests to join a committee or with questions about strategic planning, right? So by engaging with them, you'll learn who they are, how they can, can, can contribute, and what the goal, their goals for the future might be. And this type of personal attention um, will allow you to build their capacity and it, it helps employees who feel seen, heard, and um, and valued by the organization, right? And so you're gonna be able to identify that, you know, this individual has been sitting here for four years, I don't want him to be involved, but too hesitant to really ask for that opportunity. And so, you know, you're gonna sit down and have a conversation and figure out, well, how can I build you up? Because guess what? We're not, we're not immortal, right? And so we've got to build that, that internal um, cadre of leaders for tomorrow, right? We've, we've, we've got potential amongst our ranks, but we um, really got to get to know them to be able to really, you know, harness that potential, right? Okay, so we're going into for your consideration. For your consideration. So we would like for you to consider, right, the following. Are you meaningfully engaging all of your classified professionals in regards to guided pathways? At your individual institution, we'd like for you to just kind of sit and think, are we meaningfully engaging our classified professionals, right? So when we say that, we mean not just those who work in engagement centers, right? Or other equity focused departments or programs, right? So I know in regards to guided pathways, I've heard a ton about counseling and obviously counseling is very important to the implementation of guided pathways, but that there, are you engaging individuals other than your CPROs in counseling? Are you engaging your individuals in financial aid? Are you engaging the CPROs in uh, student activities, right? Are you engaging those you wouldn't necessarily, you know, off the top of your head think of in regards to guided pathways? Because there's some valuable information there as well, right? So are you engaging those individuals? Um, how do you know? How do you know they're engaged? How do you know? Did you ask them, right? Have you outright asked your classified professionals if they feel as though they've been engaged in the guided pathways work, right? Um, also, if you did ask them, how did you ask them? Did you do it through their direct supervisor? Was it an anonymous survey? Uh, was it some other method? And the reason we say that is because I can tell you, um, being asked a question by my direct supervisor and being asked a question via an anonymous survey, I'm gonna give different feedback. I'm gonna give different feedback, right? If I'm talking to the person who writes my evaluations and determines whether or not I continue to work here, <laughs> um, which is kind of dramatic, but still, uh, you're going to get a different answer than if it's an anonymous survey, right? I'm probably going to be a little bit more forthcoming in an anonymous survey, right? Um, and then again, if you did ask, who asked? Was it in a department meeting where they were in front of all of their colleagues and peers? Was it somebody from your institutional effectiveness department? Was it your college's guided pathways coordinator? Uh, again, we argue that, you know, each of those roles um, each of those examples will, will provide you a, a different answer. If you're asking me in, in, in front of my entire department, now, obviously, I'm sure you guys have figured out I'm a little, uh, what's the word? <laughs> I'm not shy, for lack of a better term. I'm not shy. So if you ask me in front of my department, I'm going to give probably the same answer. But some of my colleagues are a little bit shy. And they're not going to say, you know, some of the things that they really think or some of the things that they really feel if it's in a group setting where everybody has to listen to them speak, Right. So how, how are you asking them, right? Are you putting them in a position where they don't feel comfortable to answer honestly and accurately? Um, and then last, but certainly not least, would they say that they've been engaged meaningfully in guided pathways? So I say that because I know that I've been in meetings where we've been talking about, oh yeah, you know, this, this group of individuals feels great about what we're doing. And then you walk out the door, you go talk to that group of individuals. They're like, no, we do not feel great about what we're doing. No, we do, we do not feel that way. No, no, not at all, right? So would they say that they have been engaged meaningfully? We're not talking about attending meetings to take notes, to you know, keep the records, to say that there was a classified professional there, <laughs> right? We're talking about, are they actively being engaged in a meaningful way in the guided pathways work at your institution? So those are some items for your consideration. Your consideration, okay. Now the painful part, it's the homework, all right? I, but I said, it's not bad. 
It's not bad, don't be scared. Okay, for your homework, we are encouraging you to poll your classified professionals to see which of the, um, the stages um, that we've listed here, they say they participated in for the implementation of guided pathways, right? Um, stage one, presented. Has the information been presented to them, right? Has, it, has the information been provided to them? Stage two, has the information been presented and some feedback was collected, right? Input was requested and based on their expertise and that input was gathered. And then once that information was gathered, um, was there, um, you know, was the information and feedback synthesized and changes been made? And so would they say that they were involved in that stage three for improvement? And then finally, um, assess, have they been involved in the, in the conversation um, that involved reviewing the data and determining whether or not the changes that were made were effective or provided the desired outcome? Um, you know, so those are the four stages. Of, Will your classified professionals say that they were maybe presented? Will they say that they were presented and maybe got a little feedback? And then maybe that's it? Because I know oftentimes I'll have a presentation that I participate or I, 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 I you know, I, I participate in um, and I'm asked for my feedback and that's about it. Um, that's about as much as I know about that, that feedback I gave, right? And how often do we participate in surveys and then it just goes off into the this. And there's my data out there and I'm not gonna like, well, what are you gonna do with that information? And what's the evidence? Again, this also speaks to relational trust in the way that you grab their information and then give it back out to the college community in the way it's reflected in improved processes and procedures. And so that's your homework. Just ask them questions. They're not gonna bite you. Now they may, we will caution you. They may tell you more than you wanna hear. Yes. Okay, you can't guarantee that once you ask a classified professional, they will ever stop talking because it's so rare that that uh, that we're asked, you know, in some instances, instances, yeah, we get asked. In other instances, not so much. And so don't be afraid of your classified professionals. We really don't fight as hard as people say we do, right? We just don't. So right. and to that, add to that, to add uh -huh. to that. Um, you know, we've given a lot of information. It feels like we give a lot of information. Um, and, you know, we, we obviously can't offer any guarantees. So we can't say, oh, if you do all of these things, we guarantee that all of your classified professionals will be actively engaged in the implementation of guided pathways at your institution. That's, that's not a guarantee that anybody could make, right? So what we're asking is for you to kind of like lead the horse to water and then hopefully they'll drink, right? Uh, we're just asking you to do things that, you know, either create or maintain an environment where they feel as though they're able to actively participate um, and are engaged in the guided pathways work at your institution. So that's kind of what we're, what we're saying. That's all we're saying. We're Natalie and Akia from Riverside City College sharing you, with you our observations as classified professionals at our organization that have been involved in the guided pathways were allowed um, since its inception. And so with that, we have a few minutes left. I think we're at about five minutes and we can take any questions if anybody has it. Yes, and you can type them in the chat. Or, or unmute, I mean, at this point, we got five minutes, right? <laughs> I've seen a lot of awesome things in the chat. Somebody shared that um, they did, um, oh, what was it? Uh, like a ride along with some of their classified mm -hmm. professionals. We've also done that, or one of the institutions that I was at previously did that, that we called it um, undercover boss, even though everybody knew the boss was there. So I don't know why we called it that, um, but it was amazing. And actually the, the, the classified professionals in that, that department were able to see some actual change. Uh, one of the administrators from financial aid went and observed and worked alongside and actually worked the window of the financial aid office and was like, oh no, this is way too many steps. This, this is way too many screens you guys have to go through to be able to provide service to your students. We're gonna see about how to get this fixed. I'm gonna talk to IT and we're gonna see, you know, it, can these be linked? Can some of this information be removed? Like what is, what's going on there? And so there was actually some improvement made uh, based on, on just that individual, you know, sitting down and working the front counter of financial aid. So if that's something that your institution is open to, I, I strongly and highly recommend uh, uh, engaging in that activity. It's also very encouraging as classified professionals to see, oh, it's not so easy, right? You just sat here and you worked a line that was outside of the door and you're tired too, right? <laughs> so I would, I would definitely encourage that. Absolutely. 
So, well, we thank you guys for your time. We know we jibber jabber and you had cats crossing screens and interesting things like that, but we really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your time. And we hope you have a lovely afternoon and a great rest of your summit. Yes, and if you wanna stick around, we will be in the room until at least 2.50 because that's what time it's scheduled to end. But um, feel free to stick around. I know that you might have another session to run to if, if that's the case, that's perfectly understandable and fine. Uh, this session is also being recorded. Uh, if you came in late, you will have the opportunity to, to view it uh, later. All right. I can sing. I can roll it out. No, 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 we don't want her to sing. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no. Michael's saying yes. His face is looking really. No, I don't know that. I'm gonna I, assume I, that he doesn't it. know you. That's that's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna assume he doesn't know you. <laughs> I was a choir kid. I was a, I was a second soprano, so I can't say that I can reach those notes anymore. But it was it's been really fun, you guys. I've enjoyed seeing your smile, Michael. Thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate so that. Much. It's been great. All right, you guys have a great day. <laughs>